all our lives we said, you're far and I have worked our fingers to the bone to get you out of the ghetto, and then you go to back to Oxford and you jump straight back into it. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you don't despite it, and you stand up and receive her. <laughs> this time I had enough, so I rang up about two weeks later and said, Ma, I said, I heard what you said, and I'm going to the Himalayas with some other students, they're going to become a swami. I said, I should sit outside the old screen station with a begging bowl. And all your friends and foes pass by. And my mother said, Shaky, the angel said, let's settle it, you become a rebel. <laughs> Which I did. And then Ma got interested. She said, curiously, what made you do all that, Lionel? Is it, is it, are you playing another game with me? So I said, no, I said, I had a religious experience. He said, well, what was it, what happened? So I said, well, you know, I've had that rather rocky time of puberty. And I realized after seeing a girlfriend that um, I was also gay. And I didn't know how to cope with it because at that time I was criminal and I was just at sea with the whole bloody business. And then walking back to Balliol, I, the rain was pouring down and I stood in the portico of a, taking shelter in the house in St. Giles. And then, pretty grey inside, just as it was grey outside, and then the door opened and an elderly woman came out and she took me by the hand and led me into a meeting in which some people's old men sat around in a circle. I thought, what the hell have I come to? And I was in a Quaker meeting for farmers who had no who couldn't find anybody to look after their cattle on a Sunday, so they used to come on Thursday, Thursday morning, you see, for a, for a meeting. And I sat there thinking, what's a Yiddish boy like me doing in a place like this? <laughs> and then as a Marxist, I thought they're all bonkers, sort of talking to some being who isn't there. But gradually, the goodness and kindness of those Quaker farmers got through to me. And someone said something which made an enormous amount, meant an enormous amount to me. He said, your successes make you clever, but only your problems make you wise. And I thought how right he was. At Oxford I had learned a great deal of cleverness, but I hadn't learned compassion. And I thought, good God, it's only through my problems I shall learn it. It's only through my problems I should learn what mercy is, what compassion is, and what it's like to be at the wrong end of the stick. And so my world turned inside out, and I thought, well, there's something in this. Let's see what carries on. And also, a boy started speaking within me, and we had a sort of interior conversation. And I thought at first that I was the ventriloquist, and this was, the voice was my dummy. And then I thought, perhaps I was schizoid in addition to all my other worms. <laughs> I went inside, I wasn't like that at all. But that voice also taught me that giving was nicer than taking. So I went into religion and I tried to tell my mother, and she listened to it carefully, and she said, well, wouldn't that religion make you nicer, Lionel? I said, I don't know, Lionel. Be, being demoralized, I said, being honest, religion could make you nasty as well as nice. You only had to leave the papers to see that. I said, we just have to see, won't we? Now, you can't prove God and you can't prove heaven and that sort of thing, but you can have evidence of it, and I suppose the proof of it is what effect it has on you. And for me, its effect was to make a grim, rather nasty young man, involved in his own problems, a nicer person. And so therefore I've stuck with it all these years. And I think lots of people have religious experiences, just like I did, but in the materialistic age, they're inclined to underrate them and throw them away. For example, a woman said to me in the park, no Rabbi Bush, I've never had any religious experiences. And then she said, but two or three weeks ago, I was in a supermarket, and the woman in front of me had messed up her credit cards, and the girl at the, the checkout was having hysterics. She said, the, the old man behind me, she said, who was so furious about being kept waiting, that he kept on batting me in my backside with his trolley. <laughs> he said, I was about to get, to get annoyed with all of them and join in the fray. She said, when suddenly she said, I burst into laughter. She said, I helped the woman sort out her credit cards. I pacified the checkout girl. She said, they even waved my bum about a bit so the man behind me could have a better target for his <laughs> So she said, 
Well, what was that Rabbi Blue? I said, darling, you should be very thankful you had a moment of grace. You stepped into heaven. And then heaven can happen in very odd times. During the last year, I go to the hospital more and more often, as most holidays do. And uh, one morning, the ambulance had to come for me, clanging me to take me to hospital about four o'clock in the morning. They didn't know where to put me. So I found myself in a ward for old men, which is very depressing. <laughs> and I put myself, my brother, this is the pits. But I had a high temperature, didn't know what to do. They put me into bed. And at night, I, had to I woke up trying to get to the bathroom, but I couldn't make it. And as I went across the floor, I bumped into a table, lots of bottles went flying, you see, and I started to get feeling sick, and it was a terrible mess, and I felt like a child who'd been caught, you know, in, you know, wetting his trousers or something like that. And I was just weeping, and then, um, then a voice said behind me, um, don't worry, mate, he said, I'm with you, I'm behind you. And the man in the next bed to me, who was 10 years older than me, and I was 80, coming up 81, who was about 1895, had gone out, had tumbled out of the bed and had come to help me. And I thought, well, that's, that's turned my hell into heaven. And I think that in this life, and I told my mother this, in this life, you, there are moments when hell, heaven is like a kind of gravity. Something pulls you towards you, making you kinder and nicer than you were. You have very last for a few minutes, but then the glow of it remains in you afterwards. Or well, there's some ball who rings you up and you want to press down the receiver, but something in you says, listen, listen a bit longer, and you do. And that is heaven. And I told my mother this as she was getting past it and getting near dying, actually. And I told her that in this, you already know where you're going, darling because you've already, you've already experienced in this life a foretaste of what it's going to be. And um, this world is not our real home. This is only a temporary stop in our long existence. And I'll see you there. And Ma said, well, Lionel, she said, okay. She said, I'll go along with that. She said, but I've never got into heaven or that sort of thing. I said, yes, you did. There was a time when you gave your, your lot only winter coat when we, Dad was out of work to the cleaning woman. I said, there was a time I remember during the Blitz when you went out of the Anderson shelter we had while the hack hack and bombs were flying down to risk getting a man, uh, uh, um, barber's um, tools of his trade. He was frightened to blow up and he would never be able to earn anything again. I said, you had your share in it too. And she said, well, Alan, tell me something to cheer me up. So I said, okay, darling. And I told her this story. So Michael's at the gate of heaven. And the man comes along to him who has got just skin and bone, no flesh on him at all. And so Michael says, the archangel Michael says, I can see, he said, you're an ascetic for the sake of heaven. Go to gate seven for the seventh heaven. And another man comes up who's got wheels and blood is coming from all his wounds. And so Michael says, Oh, he said, I can see that you are a martyr for the sake of heaven, for the sake of God. Go to gate seven for the seventh heaven. And then Mrs. Cohen came up and she said, look, she said, I've organized dances for the single. She said, I've organized whist drives, bridge drives, tombolas. She said, the bridge, <laughs> all that sort of thing. And she said, they said, go, go, go to gate two, Mrs. Cohen. What, she said, gate two, not gate seven. Gate two, we thought you'd like to have your hair fixed first. <laughs> <laughs> and that cheered my mother up in pleasure enormously. And then she said to me, her parting line to me um, was this, and you could help me with this. She said, her last line to me, before she became unconscious, was, line, she said, what you've done, you've done, and the rest is gravy. And ever since, I've been trying to work on it. Anyway, this book I wrote was how if you're, if you're on a God search, if you're searching for God or heaven, but don't know how to do it, here's a sort of, I've tried to do a little guidebook with some hints on how to get there. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.